Hello everyone and welcome to Catholic Truth. In this video we are going to be debunking John MacArthur, who is one of the most popular and influential Protestants on the planet, but he is also one of the most hateful and vicious anti-Catholics on the planet. Everything he says about the Catholic Church pretty much is wrong or half-truth or just erroneous, and yet you can hear the hatred and the sarcasm and the disdain that he has for the Catholic Church every time he speaks. It's an apostate, corrupted, heretical, false kind of Christianity. It is the kingdom of Satan wearing a Christian mask. So clearly he doesn't like the Catholic Church. Clearly he disagrees with Catholicism. But as we're going to see in this video, he doesn't understand Catholicism, not even remotely, which is truly sad since he's such a big influencer and is leading millions of people astray and into lies because he can't get what we believe correct in the first place. So in this video, we are going to be showing what he says about Catholicism and then showing what we actually believe. And you're going to see that they are two totally, completely different things. This is a 45-minute video of John MacArthur with debunking, so this is only part one. We're going to be making parts two and three, and we're going to have a whole CD set on this, a whole CD downloadable content on our website, but we're going to put up a few parts here on YouTube as well. And this is only part one because we can never cover all of the errors in one video. Hello everyone, my name is Brian Mercier, President of Catholic Truth. Anyone from any time, from any religion, can come here to know exactly what the Catholic Church believes and why, and how it can change your life. Make sure to check out our show description uh, notes below if you want to follow us on social media, if you need a Catholic speaker, or if you would like to support our ministry on PayPal or Patreon. John MacArthur's Calvinist Church is full of ex-Catholics, full of ex-Catholics. But to be fair, and this is a little known fact, that many Calvinists end up coming back to the Catholic Church. Many former Catholics and ex-Catholics come back to the Catholic Church when they learn more, when they know more, because many of them leave, run to these churches without knowing anything to begin with. But then after they come to know Jesus and they start studying more in depth and they study the early church and they study the Bible, they start coming back to Catholicism because they realize that Calvinism is false. John MacArthur's church is false. And it's his own church. It's not even the Church of Christ. But in this video, we're going to be seeing what he says about Catholicism and why it's false. So let's get started. The true church of the Lord Jesus has always understood this. It's always understood it since Catholicism began to form itself in the fourth century, all the way to the Reformation, even through what was known as the Dark Ages, say from 400 to 1500, leading up to the Reformation. Genuine Christian believers always set themselves against the heretical system that was developing, uh, that became known as the Roman Catholic Church. It was always rejected by the true church. And the Roman system was always going after Huguenots and um, Waldensians and uh, Anabaptists. Those were those who took issue with the system in favor of the truth. Don't you just love a good conspiracy theory? I mean, what he says sounds a lot like the Da Vinci Code, and to be honest, it's just as credible. And uh, he doesn't know what he's talking about with church history, and he makes these sweeping statements without any facts or very few facts to back it up. And he says constantly throughout this video that true Christians opposed Catholicism starting in the 4th century, in the 7th century, 10th century, through the Middle Ages, and he makes it seem like all Christians down through the ages opposed Catholicism. But there weren't any other Christians down through the ages. In the 4th century, there was only Catholicism. There, that was the only Christian church. If he's going to uh, assert that there's another Christian church, then he actually needs to prove that. He needs to show what church this is. Was it Calvinist, as he believes? Or was it Lutheran, which disagrees with Calvinists? Or was it a Baptist church, which disagrees with both of them? Or was it Pentecostal in nature? I mean, which one of the thousands of Protestant denominations was it? Pray tell. The fact is, he can't name any leaders of this supposed early church in the 10th century, the 7th century, the 4th century. He can't name any of the Christians because there weren't any other Christians other than Catholicism. And people who say, oh, there were other Christians always, they just say that. But they can't actually name any, and that's a huge problem. People like this always say that true Christians oppose the Catholic Church, 
except that they jump to the Reformation or right before the Reformation and they show people like Wycliffe or Luther or things like that. And that's like 1500 years later. That's not the fourth century, the seventh, the tenth or anything else. They jump to the Reformation when their history starts or shortly before. Uh, they might name a couple other groups, but he, as we're going to see, his first group that he mentions, is, I believe, is the 13th century. So I'm not sure which ones he's talking about in the 10th, 7th, or 4th. The Catholic Church was around long before the 4th century. I mean, all he has to do is go back and read the earliest Christians. There were over 30 popes before the 4th century. There were over 30 popes before Constantine. And if he goes back and reads the earliest Christians, which I'm going to do for you right now just so you can see that Catholicism was started long before the 4th century. And I could give many examples, but I'm going to just give one right now. This comes from a bishop, a Catholic bishop, Cyprian of Carthage, and it is in the year 250 AD. So well before the 4th century when Catholicism was supposedly invented. Now you tell me, does this sound like a Catholic or does this sound like a Christian, a Protestant? Cyprian of Carthage says, The Lord says to Peter, Peter, I say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. And to you I will give the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever things you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever things you loosed on earth will be loosed in heaven. So on him, Peter, he builds the church, and to him he gives the command to feed the sheep. John 21, 17. And although he assigns a like power to all the apostles, yet he founded a single chair, and he established by his own authority a source of intrinsic reason for that unity. Indeed, the others were also what Peter was, an apostle. But a primacy is given to Peter, whereby it is made clear that there is but one church and one chair. So to all the apostles are shepherds, and the flock is shown to be one, fed by all the apostles in a single-minded accord. But if someone does not hold fast to this unity of Peter, can he imagine that he still holds the faith? If he should desert the chair of Peter, upon whom the church was built, can he still be confident that he is in the church? The people joined to the priests, and the flock clinging to their shepherd in the church. You ought to know, then, that the bishop is in the church, and the church is in the bishops. And if someone is not with the bishop, he is not in the church. They vainly flatter themselves who creep up not having peace with the priests of God, believing that they are secretly in communion with certain individuals. For the church, which is one and Catholic, is not split or divided, but is indeed united and joined by the cement of priests who adhere to one another. And there are other quotes, too, where he talks about the Catholic Church and the unity of the Church and the authority of the Church. And I think it's pretty clear that Catholic Bishop Cyprian, who was a Catholic bishop, who existed before the 4th century, at least 50 years before the 4th century, was a Catholic. And if the Catholic Church was invented in the 4th century, then people like Cyprian could not exist who were talking about the Catholic Church and the authority and the primacy of Peter, who were talking about the authority of the priesthood and the bishops. And if you don't have the bishops, you don't even have the church. This sounds as Catholic as it comes. John MacArthur would never be found endorsing this, and yet this is a Catholic bishop before the 4th century, showing that the church did not start in the 4th century and showing that John MacArthur is incorrect. Second, did you notice, again, he doesn't actually quote any people. He just says there's these groups that always opposed Catholicism. And then he listed three groups. One was from the 13th, actually, I said that earlier. It's actually from the 14th century, the Waldensians. And then the other two he mentioned were from the 16th century. So that's the Protestant. So how does that prove his case? How does that prove that Christians have always opposed Catholicism, even though we can only quote Protestants <laughs> that came after the Reformation in one group before? The Reformation. One group that he wouldn't even think are Christians if he actually looked into their beliefs. If he actually looked into what the Waldensians believed, he would not think they are Christians. He's trying to canonize them and hold them up as Christians, but they were Catholics. And yes, they disagreed with a few teachings in the church. Mostly they disagreed with the 
the wealth and the church and they wanted to reform uh, some of the priesthood who became corrupt or became too wealthy. And uh, Peter Waldo wanted to reform those, but they were Catholic. They believed in Catholic doctrines that John MacArthur would find repugnant, would find evil and satanic in his mind, and yet he's holding them up as Christians because he hasn't done his research. He hasn't studied what they actually believe, and he's going off hearsay. And so that's why we're going to go over it right now. The Waldensians, who he thinks are true Christians who are opposing the Catholic Church, were actually Catholics, and they actually believed in the sacraments, which MacArthur would not believe. They believe in the true presence of the Eucharist. They believe in baptismal regeneration. They believe in a hierarchy of the church, priests, and bishops, and saying, if you don't have these, then you're not in the church, just like Cyprian did. I mean, seriously, does that sound like anything that John MacArthur would endorse? Of course not, because he's just trying to find groups that might have a, a beef with the church, and he's saying, oh, these are true Christians. Oh, they had a beef with the church? Oh, they're true Christians. He hasn't done his research. I hope people can see Seriously, from the other side, I hope people can see that just because someone is an influential leader doesn't mean they know what they're talking about, doesn't mean they've done their due diligent research. And this man is promoting Christians, true Christians, he calls them, true Christians who believe in baptismal regeneration, which he rejects, true Christians who believe in the true presence of the Eucharist like Catholics do today, which he rejects, true Christians who believe in a hierarchical church of priests, deacons, and bishops, just like the Catholic Church today. How can they be true Christians when he rejects all of that and he would think that true Christians reject all of that? Honestly, just by saying this, he's contradicting himself and proving his own point incorrect. The Anabaptists, for example, they rejected infant baptism, whereas the Waldensians accepted it. Does John MacArthur accept it? No, he does not. Therefore, ergo, he would not see these people as true Christians, even though he's calling them true Christians. He's literally contradicting himself. What Mr. MacArthur is doing is taking any heresy that's been in the church or any group that's disagreed with the church, and he's putting a stamp of approval on them because they oppose the Roman Catholic Church. Therefore, they must be good. This is literally the shallowest of arguments. For someone who's such a great influencer and has a lot of influence over millions of people, they should do more research on these things before they present them. I mean, it's really, truly sad, but I hope to be able to show people that he really doesn't know what he's talking about, even though he comes across so confidently. Beware people. Just because someone acts confident, talks confident, condemns others, doesn't mean they know what they're talking about. And as we're going to see, he doesn't present a lot of facts throughout his whole entire 45-minute presentation. It's just a lot of gripes against the church from his own personal opinion, and I guess we're just supposed to take his word for it. But here at Catholic Truth, we like to go by facts and not people's opinions. He says that the Catholics were always going after Huguenots, Waldensians, and Anabaptists, and those who took issue with the system. <laughs> First of all, all of these groups contradicted each other theologically and doctrinally. So how could they be the true Christians? They were three separate heretical groups that all contradicted each other. They would not have agreed with each other. They would not have seen each other as true Christians. And sometimes they even condemned each other, especially when you look at Protestantism, the early reformers, they all condemned each other fiercely as antichrist, which we'll come back to in a second. But let's just start with the Anabaptists. Luther vented his fury as did Zwingli and others, against the Anabaptists, who he's calling true Christians, by the way. The early reformers thought they were all heretics, the Anabaptists. They didn't think the Anabaptists had true doctrine, and they didn't consider them true Christians, yet MacArthur somehow thinks they're true Christians because they came into opposition with the Catholic Church and every other Protestant and Christian group in the world. But that's irrelevant to Mr. MacArthur, sadly. If it seems to fit his narrative, then... They're true Christians, but that's sad. Second, it's like saying that, oh, well, Jesus just went after the Pharisees and Sadducees and people who disagreed with his system. Yeah, because he was presenting truth and the gospel, and these people disagreed with the truth and the gospel that Christ gave, and so Christ went after them and called them out on their errors. That's like saying, oh, well, Paul called out errors, and he was just going after people in the church who disagreed with his teachings, who disagreed with the Christian gospel. Yeah, that's exactly what Christianity has done from day one. I mean, Jesus is literally the truth 
the way, the truth, and the life, John 14, 6. There's no other name under heaven by which a person could be saved except through Jesus, Acts 4, 12. And Jesus is the truth. And he gave the truth, the fullness of truth to us. So if anyone departs from that truth, of course Jesus is going to call them out on it. Of course Paul is going to call them out on it. Of course Christianity and Catholicism is going to call them out on it because we believe that Jesus started the Catholic Church, the same church that Peter had the keys of and that the apostles were the foundation of. Yes, that church who were calling out errors since the first century, of course we're calling out errors. When people depart from the truth Christ gave, we're going to call it out. We're just going to do that. That's what we've done from the beginning. However, I find that so many Protestants devolve and fall back into just crazy conspiracy theories, Da Vinci Code literature like John MacArthur, and they, they, they just throw out all these things. Oh, well, the Catholic Church just murdered everyone who didn't agree with them, and they hunted Protestants from the Vatican down, even though the Vatican didn't even exist at the time. There was no Vatican, and yet they say constantly that the Vatican hunted Protestants. Never happened. They also talk about the Inquisition and the Crusades and things they've never studied and don't know anything about, which we have videos on all of these, by the way. And they say things like, especially the most anti-Catholics, they'll say things like, oh, the Catholic Church killed 50 million people, you know, in Europe, or just 50 million people in general. But to kill 50 million, 30 million, or even 20 million, literally, you would have to kill every man, woman, and child in Europe, and then import millions more just to kill them all. Again, because there weren't even that many people on the continent in those days. And yet they're making these just outlandish nonsense claims of almost like hate and disdain that aren't based on fact and reality. And I hope people can see that just because people make claims, you have to do the research. Look them up. They never killed 50 million. <laughs> they didn't even, it doesn't even make sense. They just throw out these. And these have come from the earliest days of Protestants who have slandered the church because they didn't like the church. And they're, most times they're not based on facts, which is why we're here, which is why Catholic truth exists, which is why we make these videos. It's really sad when people give their own version of history rather than actual history. But moving on from history, he goes on to give a whole list of gripes that he thinks are wrong in the Catholic church. And he says, all true believers rejected these things. So let's see what he has to say. They understand the idolatry of saint worship. True believers understand the horrific exaltation of Mary above Christ and even above God. In this section, he says that Catholics worship Mary. Not only worship her, but worship her more than Jesus and even more than God himself. This is crazy, people. Crazy. I mean, I don't even know what to say except that hatred makes you irrational. And it makes you say irrational things. To us, this is hilarious, or at least it wouldn't, would be hilarious if it wasn't so sad. So downright sad that he actually believes this. He actually believes this. Now, it's kind of like Christopher Hitchens, who was a hateful atheist. He hated Christianity and Mother Teresa, and it caused him, generally, he was a smart guy and a witty guy and but once it came to religion, it just short-circuited things up there, and he started saying the most irrational things against Christianity, and especially against Mother Teresa, and he would just fudge facts and make things up just to get his point across if it proved him correct. And he was just so miserable, and he looked miserable. When you looked at Christians, you know, like, who debated him, who were just so happy and joyful, and then you looked at him who just looked like death on feet, death in shoes, you could see the difference between the light and the darkness. The same thing with MacArthur. When you see people who are joyful and happy about the faith and they talk about it, and then you see MacArthur who's always miserable, like Christopher Hitchens, and with this Catholicism, and he's just miserable. He looks miserable. I mean, for a Christian, I'm just saying that he becomes very irrational and says things like this that aren't even true. Does he have a single quote to back him up? No. Does he have a single source to verify what he's saying? No. Does he give us anything that would add or lend credibility to this extreme statement? No. But we do. We're going to give you, I mean, I could give you tons of quotes, but I'm just going to give you a few to show what the Catholic Church teaches of who is the Savior, who is the Lord, who is the only Redeemer, and the only way to heaven, and that's Jesus Christ. That is what we have taught for 2,000 years. Listen to what the Church says. Christ's death is both the paschal sacrifice that accomplishes the definitive redemption of men, 
and the sacrifice of the new covenant, which restores man to communion with God by reconciling him to God through the blood of the covenant. That's the Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 613, if you want to look it up. Nothing about Mary saving us. Nothing about Mary being higher. I mean, Jesus is the Lord. If you don't, you should, if you still disagree, listen to this next one. Jesus Christ is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end of everything. He is the only teacher from whom we must learn, the only Lord on whom we should depend, the only head to whom we should be united, and the only model that we should imitate. He is the only physician that we can, who can heal us, the only shepherd that can feed us, the only way that can lead us, the only truth that we can believe, and the only life that can animate us. He alone is everything to us and alone can satisfy all of our desires. And that comes from the Vatican document called Jesus is our only Savior. Did you notice <laughs> the word only used throughout that whole entire paragraph and throughout the whole document? Because it's called Jesus is the only Savior. He's the only head, the only Lord, the only physician, the only shepherd, the only way, truth, and life. The only way to salvation is Jesus. This is an official Catholic document and is our official teaching. Listen to one more. The name Jesus signifies that the very name of God is present in the person of his Son, made man for the universal and definitive redemption of sins. It is the divine name alone that brings salvation, and henceforth all can invoke his name. For Jesus united himself to all men through his incarnation, so that there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved, Acts 4.12. The name Jesus means God saves. And that comes from the Catholic Catechism, the official catechism of the Catholic Church. Notice nothing about Mary redeeming us. Nothing about Mary forgiving our sins. Nothing about Mary being a savior. And some people say, oh, but you call her co-redemptrix. Actually, that's not an official title of the Catholic Church. And even if it was, you don't know what that means. They just throw out this and they think that, oh, Mary's a co-redemptrix. That means she's a co-redeemer. That means she's co-redeeming us with Christ. That's literally not even close to what that means. <laughs> the only reason Mary participates at all is because God chose her from all eternity to bring salvation into the world. He chose her to be the mother of Christ and that Christ would come through her into this world. That is how she participates with us. She's not a co-redeemer. She's not redeeming alongside Christ. She's not next to Christ, you know, doing everything, you know, doing his work for him. No, the Catholic Church does not teach that. And any quote on Mary needs to be taken in this context. I can't help but quote just one more. And this is from St. Louis de Montfort, who has a very strong devotion to Mary, very strong devotion to Mary. And he starts out the book with proper theology. People will just go to his book and take out quotes and be like, look, he worships Mary. But they don't actually read the book and they miss quotes like this, which is the foundational context for the rest of the beliefs, which is the rest of the books, the rest of uh, his thoughts on it. Listen to what St. Louis de Montfort says, and the Catholic Church, you know, totally endorses this. He says, with the whole church, I acknowledge that Mary being a mere creature fashioned by the hands of God is, compared to his infinite majesty, is less than an atom, or rather is simply nothing, since he alone can say, I am he who is. Consequently, this great Lord, who is ever independent and self-sufficient, never had and does not now have any absolute need for the Blessed Virgin, for the accomplishment of his will in the manifestation of his glory. To do all things, he only has to will them. Wow. So he says what all Catholics believe and what the church teaches, that compared to God, that compared to Jesus Christ, the infinite Lord and master of all, infinite majesty, that she is less than an atom, that she's nothing at all, literally nothing. She's a speck of dust compared to God, okay? And when I tell Protestants that and I read them that, they're like, oh, oh, wow. You know, like, you know, that's good that you believe that. We agree. You know, like, <laughs> this is what we've taught for 2,000 years. And no creature, and I couldn't name more quotes if you need me to, no creature can compare to God. And the Catholic Church officially teaches that. 
No mere creature, including Mary, compares to God in any way, shape, and form in anything she has, or anything she is, or anything we have or are, are gifts from God. It's grace from God. It's all His grace. So the Catholic Church does not teach Mary worship. Even if some Catholics did go too far and did worship Mary, that's their problem. And they're going against their own church and the Bible and God. That's not what the Catholic Church teaches. And I hope people can see that distinction that the Catholic Church has taught for 2,000 years that Jesus alone is a Savior, Redeemer, King, Lord of all, Alpha, Omega, everything. And that Mary is nothing without Him. The Everything she has, all the beauty and grace she has, is all a gift from Him. They understand this twisted sacrament of the Mass which uh, attempts to re-sacrifice Christ. In this section, he says that the Catholics twist the sacrament of the Mass and attempt to re-sacrifice Jesus again and again. Why do so many... Now, most Protestants don't say this. Anti-Catholics say this. Catholic haters say this. They say that we re-sacrifice Jesus again at the Mass every day, thousands of times over, and this is the farthest thing from the truth. How many times do I have to say this? And John MacArthur clearly has never read a single Catholic document and actually, like, listen to it. I mean, there are people out there who try to, you know, read things to just prove their points without actually reading them for themselves. And he seems to have that problem as well. Because the Catholic Church doesn't teach this. This is heresy. We don't teach that Jesus dies again. Jesus died once and for all, as it says in Hebrews chapter 9. And he can't die again. So he's not sacrificed again at the Mass. He's not killed again at the Mass. And everything John MacArthur says about the Catholic Church in this regard, and in most regards, is a lie from hell. It's not from God because God is a God of truth. And he's so antagonistic against the church that he doesn't even allow himself to present what the Catholic Church teaches and then have a serious discussion about it. And for the record, we invited him for a formal debate and heard nothing back from him. And instead of beating a dead horse on, I mean, I've repeated this time and time and time again in many other videos, but for people who have never heard this before or think that Catholics really do sacrifice Jesus and don't understand our teaching, I'm just going to replay a clip from one of our other videos where we've already said it a thousand times and it, this debunks what MacArthur has to say, hands down. He falls for the classic Protestant anti-Catholic blunder which says that Jesus is re-sacrificed every Mass for us. And he says, why would I be part of a system that re-sacrifices Jesus when Jesus' sacrifice was done once and for all? This is a huge disservice and a huge slander because the Catholic Church has never said one thing. And I would challenge any Protestant out there to find me one verse, just one quote, in any official Catholic source or teaching that says that Christ is re-sacrificed over and over again at every Mass, and we have to re-sacrifice him because somehow his sacrifice on Calvary wasn't good enough, and if it wasn't good enough on Calvary, how is it going to be good enough re-sacrificing him at the Mass? But, of course, the Catholic Church says just the opposite, and has reiterated over and over and over and over again that Christ does not die again. He can't die again. The Bible specifically says that he died once and for all. That's it, once and for all. So once has been done, he can't die again. So we don't actually believe that he's re-sacrificed. What we do believe is that the sacrifice done one, once and for all is represented to us at the Mass in a special way through the Eucharist. And that his sacrifice, which is perpetually being made before the Father in Heaven on our behalf, it, the merits of that and what we receive from that is given to us in and through the Mass, in a special way through the Eucharist. The once has been done for all. Jesus will never die again. But his sacrifice is given freely for all mankind for all ages. And all mankind and all ages have not come yet. Many people still have yet to be born, and that sacrifice is for them as well. So it can be given to anyone, anywhere, at any time. But what we're saying is that that perfect sacrifice done on the cross once and for all is represented to us at every Mass. The special graces of Calvary, the the special victory and merits of Calvary, his body and blood are given to us in a special way, represented to us in a special way at the Mass, because Jesus is constantly making intercession for us and constantly being our victim in heaven and presenting himself to the Father on our behalf for our sins, for our salvation, and we receive the merits of that at the Mass. Not that Jesus is actually killed over and over again. That would make 
absolutely no sense. I'm going to quote to you first the Catechism, paragraphs 130, 153, and 162. I'm going to summarize them. It says, The Mass makes present, quote, the one sacrifice of Christ the Savior. The power of the words of the action of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit make sacramentally present under the species of bread and wine, Christ's body and blood, that sacrifice which was offered on the cross once and for all. The Eucharist is a memorial of Christ's Passover, the making present in the sacramental offering of his unique sacrifice. So notice that we don't sacrifice Christ. It says that it's by the power of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit that he is able to give us the fruits of of his cross 2,000 years ago, his body and his blood, and make those graces known to us today. It also says that the Council of Trent, quote, the bloody sacrifice which was accomplished once on the cross so that it might be represented to us and the memory of it remains even unto the end of the world. The fruits indeed of this oblation of the bloody sacrifice are received most plentifully through the unbloody one. So far as this latter one derogating in any way from the former oblation. So, I mean, I could quote a thousand things, but this specifically says that the once and for all uh, sacrifice of Christ is represented, not re-sacrificed, not re-killed. We don't kill him. It doesn't even make sense to kill Jesus. He can't be killed. He's God. You can't kill him again. He gave up his life once and for all. But besides the nonsensical nature of that, it specifically says that it is all represented to us and the memory of it remains in the Eucharist until the end of time. So we can still receive the effects of it and we can still receive the benefits of it and it's presented to us by the power of the Holy Spirit from God and we can receive that one holy sacrifice even today in a special way through the Eucharist. The money motives behind the invention of purgatory is a way to raise money. Uh, people giving money to the church to buy uh, their dead relatives out of this imaginary place called purgatory. In this next section, John MacArthur says that the Catholic Church invented purgatory as a money-making scheme so that they could buy their dead relatives out of there in order to make money. Wow. 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10 talks about how certain groups of people will not get to heaven, including adulterers, murderers. But also on par with that, it is slanderers, people who slander others, like John MacArthur is doing, and R.C. Sproul, and many other people out there, Ray Comfort. They slander the Catholic Church, and literally the Bible puts that on par with murder and adultery, and it says people who do this will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. I want people out there to know and to see how grave and serious this is, that if you side with MacArthur, you're siding with a slanderer and a liar and someone who's not presenting things that are truthful about the Catholic Church. First of all, he doesn't give any facts. We're just supposed to take his opinion for it, that the Catholic Church did this for a money-making scheme. Okay, what's your proof? Where's your proof? What documents do you have to back yourself up with? What sources can you cite to prove that? This is literally just your opinion, and I'm not taking it. Second of all, he has to say when the Catholic Church invented this. Why? And actually give facts. And most people say it's around the year 1200, or sometimes they say earlier, but the belief in purgatory goes back to the earliest Christian. St. Augustine taught it, as we've quoted in many other videos, in the 5th century. So how could it be a, a Middle Ages thing that was invented by the Catholic Church to make money? And isn't this calling the kettle black? Mr. MacArthur making millions on preaching the gospel. Millions! I mean, some people, if you look online, it says some websites say that he's worth 14 million, and that's come from popular net worth Com. He says he's worth $14 million, and he's talking about the Catholic Church making money. He's taking advantage of all these people in his pews who know literally nothing, most of them, all these former Catholics who know nothing, and he's taking advantage of them by saying all this stuff and thinking nobody's going to research it. Of course, when people do research it, they leave the church and come back to Catholicism because they realize he's preaching wrong things. Even Protestants, many Protestants who join his church end up leaving and becoming Catholic because they realize what he's teaching is bunk. There are websites online that 
that hold him at 20 million or even 75 million in all of his assets. And he's talking about other people making millions of dollars. Really? Ha. Huh. How can he with a straight face saying that someone else is making money when he himself is making a ton of money, a buttload of money in the work that he does? I don't think he realizes that charging for a mass card, like so you can have prayer said for the dead, are between $5. That's the majority of what they are, $5 for a mass card to have a mass said. It's $5. Wow, what a money-making scheme. Woo, those Catholics, how dare they? charge $5 for cards. I mean, it could be charged up to $20, but I mean, seriously, like if you're trying to create a money-making scheme, why in the world would you just make $5 or $20, you know, to cover the costs or whatever, or the, the priest time or whatever, but like literally $5, $20 here, there, that's not a lot of money, even over the course of a whole entire year compared to millions of dollars that are being made by uh, many of these influencers, these health and wealth preachers, these Protestant pastors. They're the first to point the finger at how rich the Vatican is, how rich the Pope is, even though the Vatican and the Pope are the ones who are giving more money to the poor people around the world, have more social services than anyone on the planet, who feed more people, clothe more people, start hospitals, orphanages, runaway shelters, combat trafficking, and countless more things across the face of the earth that John MacArthur could not even dream of. He's this small man who's doing nothing in compared to contrasting the Catholic Church and what she has done and is doing for over 2,000 years. The amount of social services and charity that the Catholic Church does with her money, it's immense. Whereas John MacArthur can't even compare in the same way. The Pope personally serves people. He goes and visits poor people. He holds dinners for poor people in the Vatican. I mean, that's what it's there for. <clears throat> he actually has hundreds of homeless people from around Rome come there and have the most glorious dinner they've ever had in their entire life. They receive showers, people shave their beards, and they treat them with the worth of an angel. They treat these people with the utmost dignity and they love them and they help them and they feed them. When was the last time, Mr. MacArthur, that you invited poor people to your house to throw an extravagant dinner, to love these poor people, to help these poor people? When was the last time you did this, when you got down on your knees and you washed their feet? You're pointing the finger and yet the mirror's right back at you. We're just scratching the tip of the iceberg of his errors here, but we're starting to get a little long-winded. But in the next section, which we're going to save for the next video, you're going to see that John MacArthur actually keeps referring to the true church. The true church rejects Catholicism. The true church rejects uh, Roman Catholicism. The true church has always resisted this system. The true church has resisted the Pope. The true church, the true church, he says it like a hundred times. And yet he can't name this true church. What true church is this, Mr. MacArthur? You are literally contradicting yourself and you're literally just proving yourself. I don't even need to do this job because you're doing it for yourself. For the simple reason is that most people in the world are not Calvinist like John MacArthur is. John MacArthur believes that Jesus went to hell, literal hellfire, for three days. He went to eternal hell for three days and burned there for our sins. There is no other Christian on the planet who believes that. John Calvin believed it, and hardcore Calvinists believe it, although many Calvinists do not believe it, but John MacArthur believes this. So, pray tell, Mr. MacArthur, which Christians are the true Christians? The ones who believe that Jesus went to hell for three days, like you, or all the other Christians in Christianity across the board, including Protestants, who reject that? You're trying to make all of Protestantism or pretty much any Christian who disagrees with the Catholic Church, all one church, when you all disagree on the basic fundamental doctrines. He's trying to pretend that there's some unity there across the board where we all just believe the same things, and Roman Catholicism has perverted that true message when Luther and Calvin and Zwingli and others couldn't even agree on what the gospel is. They couldn't even agree on how to be saved. So how can you cl <laughs> sanely claim to that these were the true Christians when they didn't even agree with each other? Which is the true Christian? Lutheran or Calvin? Or Zwingli? You know, Presbyterian or Baptist? Pentecostal or Methodist? I mean, which one? Or Anglican? 
for the record, or any of them. Which one is the true Christians? This can't even be taken seriously, Mr. MacArthur. And the fact that he repeats these over and over and over again to his audience, the true Christians, the true Christians, the true, it's a subtle brainwashing that doesn't make it any more true. And we're going to go in deep diving depth into this in the next video, part two, to show just how monumentally untrue this is and just how divided the early reformers were, how they attacked each other as the Antichrist, literally said that each other was the Antichrist, said that they weren't even true Christians. Martin Luther said Zwingli didn't even have the spirit of Christ. Zwingli was another Christian. He was another reformer, and he said he wasn't even of Christ. And Zwingli said the same thing of Luther. Literally, they condemned each other to hell. How could that be true Christianity? How can anybody take that seriously? How can anybody? I mean, even when atheists look at Christianity, they say, you guys can't even get it straight among yourselves. When you all figure it out, then I'll consider becoming a Christian. And I say, you have a good point. But it wasn't always that way. There was pretty much one church for 1,500 years until the Protestant revolt the Protestant anarchy. And since then, there have been thousands of religions. Just from Luther alone, by the time he died, there were over 240 new religions. And now there are thousands. And it is confusing. And it isn't from Christ. Because Christ says in John chapter 17, I pray that they would be one as we are one. And also in uh, the epistles of Paul, he says that there is one faith, one hope, one baptism, one doctrine. And anybody who departs from that doctrine, it's called schism. And it's seriously condemned in the Bible. Are you in schism? Have you left the Catholic Church without researching it first? I almost left the Catholic Church because I was scared that the Catholic Church might be wrong. People were telling me about things in the Bible and showing me where Catholicism was wrong in the Bible and saying this and saying that. And I had no idea. But rather than get scared and run off, and join these other religions or just leave the Catholic Church because I've discovered that it's evil by reading the Bible, which is really what other people just told me the Bible says. I went and researched it first, did some deep research, and I found that the Catholic Church actually has really good answers for believing what she does from the Bible. And it can be backed up by history and tradition, which the Protestants can't be. They just go by their own personal interpretations of the Bible, their personal opinions, but it can't be backed up by history or what the earliest Christians taught. So if you're someone who has left the church, or if you're struggling, or if you have questions, this is why we're here. We're here to help answer your questions. We're here to help answer your doubts. We're here to give you good answers to your good questions. And if you're someone who has left, and I know many are looking back, and I just know from every week here, people tell us that because of your ministry here at Catholic Truth, we've come home. Or we're a Protestant, we're coming into the Catholic Church, which is amazing, and we thank Jesus Christ for that. We thank our Lord for allowing us to have a small part in your conversion experience in that. But if you are someone, you can reach out to us uh, and check out our videos and do some research. Read the Catechism. Read the uh, uh, books. I have several books on what Catholics truly believe. It's much different than what people say say we believe. And I would challenge you to watch our videos, listen to our podcasts, and read some good books on the subject. You will see the truth as Jesus talks about in John chapter 8, and that truth will set you free. Thank you so much for watching this part one. I can't wait to make part two and get it out here, and part three and part four as well. This is going to be about a three to four hour debunking, and it's going to be long because there's. I just want to show people how many errors are in one short 45 minute talk of John MacArthur, just how many wrong things he says. Same thing with Mike Gendron and Ray Comfort and many of the other people out there who haven't done their due diligence or research. But thank you so much for watching. Please share this with everyone you know so we can get the truth out there and undo a lot of these lies. Share it on your social media. Send it to people who hate the Catholic Church. Put it on all John MacArthur's videos. And if they turn on the, off the comments, put it on other people who post his videos and put these this link in all of these other places so that people can see what the truth is, what he says, and then what the truth is. Make sure to follow us on social media below if you would like daily inspiration. If you would like us to come to your church or your parish to give you apologetic seminars or just to give you a retreat or a conference, something inspirational, please check out our website at catholictruth.org. And if you would please consider supporting our ministry one time, periodic, or even monthly, See our Patreon or our PayPal down below. You can support this ministry, the work we do, the people we're bringing home, the lives we're changing, the souls we're saving, all the work that God has asked us to do, we are trying to do 
and to do well. And we need people like you to help support this growing ministry. So please support our ministry generously and we will be forever grateful. Pray for us as we're always praying for you. God bless you.